So I started. Welcome everybody to the webinar, Making the European Green Deal Work. The European Union aims to be climate neutral by 2050. And the European Green Deal outlines a comprehensive roadmap towards a climate neutral society covering almost all economic sectors and all levels of governance, from the international to the local level. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen famously described the European Green Deal as Europe's man on the moon moment. Today, we will ask what happens when the European Green Deal hits the ground. More specifically, what does the European Green Deal mean for the Visegrad countries, for our region, for our everyday life. My name is Christina Kurze. I'm associate professor at Andrashi University Budapest, and I'm very delighted that Andrashi University joins the global initiative of Bard College, Solve Climate by 2030, which is supported by the Open Society University Network. Over the past two weeks, about 100 universities worldwide launched dialogues on the urgent question of how to fight climate change in their countries and their regions. So thanks to all of you for taking part in this global discussion here with us today. Some practical information before we get really started. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and to contribute to the discussion, please use the chat function and send your message to everyone. You can do so throughout the webinar and we will collect your questions and they will be addressed in the Q&A part following the panel discussion. Now, before my co-moderator and main organizer of this event, Rafael Fabianovic, will introduce our distinguished panelists, let's watch first the video message sent to us from the director of the Center for Environmental Policy at Bard College. Welcome to the Solve Climate Global Dialogues. You're participating in one of 125 events held across the planet, including in almost all 50 US states, part of a global project called Solve Climate by 2030. My name is Eben Goodstein, and I'm an economist and director of the Graduate Programs in Sustainability at Bard College in New York, the lead organizer for Solve Climate. This last year has been difficult for everyone. As the world looks forward to recovery from COVID, we are focusing tonight on the most important question facing humanity. What can we do in this year in our regions to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced widespread loss of life, economic disaster, and joblessness? Worldwide, from Australia to Kyrgyzstan, from Colombia to Malaysia, and from South Carolina to South Africa, solve climate audiences are hearing from local experts and young leaders about concrete steps that can really help nations solve climate change while creating much needed jobs and incomes for everybody. The year 2020 was one of the two hottest years in human history, bringing with it massive forest and grassland fires, record-breaking storms and hurricanes, and relentless rising seas. Solving climate is the challenge which the human species must now face. There's hope for the future. Solutions have continued to advance. This year, China committed to building a carbon neutral economy while the US rejoined the Paris Agreement. Solar, wind, and battery prices continue to fall while major car companies have been rushing to electrify the global fleet. Worldwide, movements for Black Lives Matter and Me Too are leading in bringing much delayed and urgently needed justice to the world. Time is short. We have until 2030. 10 years to solve climate. We can get a lot done in this decade. We have the solutions, but only if we focus the world on climate solutions and justice, and then do the work we have to do in our own cities and regions. For students listening, you are the leaders. Without you, the future we envision will not come. I'm asking tonight for your help. We're gonna discover powerful ideas for climate solutions and climate justice, and how you can be a part of the solution. But this message must reach beyond those of us who are listening right now. Would you ask all your teachers this week, every subject, to make climate a class? 
The teacher can assign tonight's webinars homework for the students and then afterwards have a one class period discussion. And we mean every subject from art to engineering, psychology to business, dance to chemistry. Teachers don't need to be a climate expert to lead a discussion about climate change. The Solve Climate Project has easy to use teacher's guides in nearly every subject and in three languages to help teachers make climate relevant to their class. It only takes courage. Don't take no for an answer. Ask them, why not? This is your future. You'll be surprised how many teachers will say yes and thank you. Imagine you, thousands of leaders like you around the world asking their teachers once every school term to make climate a class. That means every term going forwards, hundreds of thousands, millions of students worldwide in their classes talking about climate solutions. COVID has shown how fragile our global economy and society are to extreme events. It's also shown that vulnerable people are facing the hardest, most damaging impacts. This is also true with climate change. Science has made it clear that unchecked global warming will mean an unending onslaught of extreme events, causing untold suffering for humanity and all creatures, species driven to extinction, a planet of environmental refugees. And yet, in many ways, this is the most exciting time to ever be alive as a human. We have the tools and networks and technologies to rewire the world with clean energy, reimagine the global food system, reinvent transportation, and regenerate forests and grasslands, and be well on our way to solving climate by 2030. Tonight, we will learn how to do this in our own cities, our own towns, our own regions. Thank you for the work you will do to promote climate solutions and a just world. So thank you very much. So I would take the word now. I would like to thank all our extinguished guests to join us today. I would introduce them as well. Uh, we have here Mr. Attila Steiner, State Secretary of Hungary for Circular Economy, Energy and Climate Policy. It's our great honor to have you here, sir. As well, we can welcome Mr. Andras Hussar, Director and Co-Founder of the Green Policy Center. Uh, we have our lady in the panel, Ms. Lida Bartuszek, Secretary Gener General of V4SDG, Visegrad for Sustainability. It's a regional um, youth sustainability organization and Mr. Samuel Schmidt, master's student at the Andras University Budapest and the University of Passau. So we have here uh, multiple generations as well, um, a lot of or, or diverse gender um, taking into the consideration a uh, lovely co-host. So I'm looking forward to a diverse discussion as well. I would kick it off uh, with the first question, uh, just a short remark here with the First question, you have also the opportunity to present your opening statement. The question is quite broadly um, formulated, so feel free to go a bit beyond. Uh, I would start with the lady and the panel, Ms. Lida Bartuszek. Uh, what does mean the European Green Deal to you? And the floor is yours. Thank you so much. First of all, good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you so much, Rafael, for moderating the discussion. Um, it's I think I, now we can we can uh, let the others know as well that Rafael also works in a V4SDG as well. So this is where the connection comes from. Um, so my name is Dila Bartisak. Uh, I'm now the Secretary General of Visegrad for Sustainability. As Rafael mentioned, we are a youth-led organization, an NGO here in, uh, in the Visegrad region. We have members from all around uh, the V4 countries. And our uh, long-term goal and umbrella goal is to actually help the implementation of the UN sustainability uh, goals here in the region. And also, uh, if we go into more details, um, we also um, organized one of the first uh, sustainability expos uh, here in Hungary last year. Uh, and also more than that, we also established uh, a community of experts, young experts, it's called V4SDG Lab, where we're really uh, looking forward to having uh, diverse backgrounds when it comes to uh, different fields of sustainability. And, and we really hope that throughout these research that our young members um, actually conduct throughout the years, uh, we can also contribute in great lengths to the, the policy making 
uh, for which we also have a branch. It's called V4 SDG Compass, dealing with policy mapping here in uh, in the region and also with uh, coming forward with policy suggestions that we really hope uh, we can actually um, discuss also uh, during during high level discussions um, with the respective. Um, Part, uh, representatives uh, and also we established the first sustainability platform it's called v for sdg connect and uh, it's such as like a mini linkedin but it's definitely for only for sustainability advocates in the region and beyond and also uh, it's really uh, the first to to actually have the possibility to cooperate online uh, and, and also to bring your own projects to the platforms um, as for the question and as for the topic, uh, it's, it's also uh, close to my heart personally because I conduct currently my PhD studies as well at the National University of Public Service here in Hungary. And my subject is about the implementation of the UN SDGs when it comes to the European Union level and how uh, through the European Union and through its, its legal um, um, work, how it can actually come down to the national levels, but moreover also to the citizens themselves. Um, as for me, the European Green Deal is most certainly a really ambitious agenda, but I was really happy to see it uh, on, the, on the agenda of the new commission. Uh, I believe that one of the main message that we have to take away from, from the European Green Deal is actually to also involve uh, the NGO sector uh, and the business sector, academia as well, uh, and also to, to really help and, and think about it, not just uh, when it comes to uh, obviously very, very, very important high level discussions, but also when it comes to the specific sectors uh, and the representatives thereof. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. And uh, yeah, I, I, with that, I will yield back the floor to Rafael. Thank you very much, uh, Lila. Uh, we are very good in time. Thank you that you make it also you know, a bit shorter. Uh, we have a full agenda today. I'd like to pass the ball now to Mr. Steiner, our very extinguished guest today. Um, also to you, the question, uh, what does the European Green Deal mean to you? And you can also um, combine it with a short note of yours and um, opening statement. Thank you very much and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor for me to participate uh, in this webinar. I think this is a very, very uh, exciting question, uh, how this Green Deal will be implemented in the, in the everyday, everyday life and whether Europe will be able to fulfill uh, its objectives to be climate neutral by 2050. And actually, this is the uh, key question also for me, that uh, uh, it's a nice strategy and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the majority of, of people support this endeavor to be climate neutral, but what are the exact means and how we can uh, have such a system and, uh, and basically to, to execute those changes in, in the reality? I think this is the key question for me. I'm dealing with um, energy and climate related issues uh, since uh, 15 years and uh, I had the opportunity to uh, be on the in the private sector, but also uh, to be involved in the European legislation. And now I'm responsible for the government side, the government of Hungary side uh, for, for this question. So I think uh, um, uh, I, I had the opportunity to, to collect uh, different views and different viewpoints. And I think this will be the, uh, the key question, how to master this plan uh, in the reality. And, uh, um, uh, from my side, uh, I think um, uh, this is a huge challenge since we have to re reschedule and restructure our energy infrastructure uh, in the frame of the European Green Deal, uh, which, which is a huge challenge from policy perspective, from finance financing perspective, from a social support perspective. And I think if we um, go forward uh, uh, with this program, we shouldn't forget about additional aspects also, or which is also supply security of energy, because without energy, uh, the, uh, we, could, we could face re really big problems, in, for example, in industry and also in everyday life. And also the question of affordability, how much we, we should pay for that. And I think if we can balance these uh, 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 three perspectives, uh, affordability, supply security, and also sustainability, 
then uh, we will be able to uh, get the uh, uh, social support for that and also the political support for that to push through this very ambitious agenda. This is very briefly and looking for the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Steiner, for your uh, message. I, I very much find it interesting that you mentioned the affordability, the supply, the sustainability as three key pillars for political and social change. Uh, I'm sure that our um, next panelist will touch on that too. Uh, I would like to proceed with Mr. Andras Hussar. Um, the floor is yours, please. What does the European Green Deal mean to you? And uh, also feel free to um, add a short opening. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the invitation. It's good to be among friends. Um, I'm a fellow doctorate student with, with Lila at the National University of Public Service. And we just had a podcast interview with Mr. State Secretary. So <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to, to be the same panel uh, with them. I'm, um, I'm Andreas Husser. I'm the co-founder and director of the Green Policy Center, which is a Hungarian-based uh, sustainability and climate think tank and advisory. We are relatively new. Uh, but we are looking forward to, to um, broaden our operation. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are really looking forward to, to the discussions uh, about climate change related issues, because I think uh, there will be a lot to talk about, but more importantly, there's a lot to do. And um, yeah, what does the, the European Green Deal means for me? Well, it means a lot of work, <laughs> probably because uh, there will be so many initiatives coming out uh, from the European Commission, from the government, uh, from NGOs, uh, etc. But we need to make them, uh, uh, you know, a, re um, a reality. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, we are entered into the era of implementation and time is running out. I think we are in the last decade where, where we can make a meaningful impact and we can shift uh, the trends into the right direction. So there's no more room for talking, basically. We, we need to implement, and I really like this message uh, that you presented in the, the beginning of this meeting, that we need to uh, you know, come up with, with uh, real life solutions and we need to disseminate uh, these ideas uh, as much as possible. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to contribute to this uh, effort, I would say. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's a lot uh, that can be said, uh, but I will keep it short now. Maybe I will mention just one aspect, which I think is particularly important. And I think today's discussion will be around that as well, is uh, regionalism in the implementation, because uh, I think uh, we four countries have an excellent cooperation in, uh, in many areas, but uh, we are yet to see how this uh, cooperation can be strengthened uh, in terms of climate change or green policies, etc. Because I think there are many, many opportunities that can be explored. And uh, we for SDG and us as well, we are trying to promote this kind of cooperation am among, uh, not only among the countries or the governments, but among uh, uh, think tanks, NGOs, uh, ordinary people. Uh, so I think there is, there is a lot to talk about here. And we, we would like to strengthen the, the cooperation among these four countries. Uh, maybe even, even a broader uh, cooperation with, with some uh, additional countries as well, because uh, as I said, I really believe in regionalism uh, in terms of the implementation of the climate policies. So I will stop here now and uh, I would be happy to, to take further questions. Thank you so much. That was very insightful. I, I very much like the time for action and that um, we are in the era of implementation. So. Let us turn to a young representative, uh, probably the young, youngest generation here, Mr. Samuel Schmidt, a student at Andras University. Uh, what do you think about this time for action and uh, what does it mean for you, the European Green Deal? And you can also add a short opening statement. Yes, yeah, thank you so much for being here and, and for talking in this, in this setting with all of you. Um, I think when, when we, talk about um, the, the personal impact that is then um, at first about consumption 
patterns and and what every individual um, can can also contribute on uh, on that level um, that is of, of of course just one part that we need a, um, a, a systemic uh, transformation not just an incremental a, a deep and 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 um, systemic transition but if we if we ask what every every one of us can can um, help therefore I, I think it's important um, to reflect a bit on on what are the what is the the daily behavior of, of all of us in in daily life and then you can think about easy things easy um, easy habits uh, where maybe everyone can um, make still improvements uh, whether it's turning off the the light when you leave the room or a simple simple issues at first but if we if we consider uh, the whole world and uh, should consider those aspects then in the end it's not so little anymore so um the, I mean, buying less less plastic and um, using the bike um, in the city for short distances, and um, all of those um, those those uh, sustainable uh, behaviors. Yeah, and um, I think that we we have to um, get a, um, a a feeling of. Um, acting in 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 a way um that it that it doesn't harm um basically others if we if we implement such a way of uh, of thinking um according you can say according to Immanuel kant on a global scale on a global level um then we you can reach a lot um with with, with um such an ambitious thinking where you also consider um uh, your own behavior, not just uh, the systemic um, transition. Thank you. So yeah, maybe much. I make here uh, a point at first and uh, look forward for the for the further discussion and to go into then into more specific points uh, about the transition um, what the European Union now has to to do to implement in the member states and also what is relevant on a on a global scale and on a global level. Thank I, you very much. I believe this is a very important point about the everyday life practicability. practicability. Um, I would now take it to the um, yeah second part of the first question. Uh, we were speaking about the European Green Deal and its importance. Um, if we look, I just throw a, something, a challenge into it. Um, a lot of people are talking about fossil fuels and challenges around Central and Eastern Europe. And we are in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, a lot of participants, are, of course, from Hungary. Um, so, dear panelists, what do you think? Uh, what is uh, important if we talk about European Green Deal in connection in context of Central and Eastern Europe and especially of the Visegrad countries? Um, so maybe we would start with Mr. Attila Steiner. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, um, um, I think it's very important that uh, uh, this region uh, and the, the starting point uh, to, to uh, uh, reach climate neutrality in this region is, is quite similar. Of course, we have di different energy mixes uh, in different countries, but actually how old is the infrastructure, how we, were, we have uh, some basic infrastructure as natural gas infrastructure. In the Visegrad four countries, the situation is more or less uh, similar. Uh, so basically, we have a, a joint uh, starting point. We have different uh, uh, similar level of more or less uh, similar level of economic development, um, which means that it's uh, quite natural that we articulate our view together. And actually, this is uh, the reality, uh, what we do uh, in the European Union negotiations in Brussels. The four member states, the four Visegrad uh, uh, countries, uh, coordinate its uh, positions quite intensively. We have always a separate session before each uh, council session where all, all of the member states um, discuss uh, the issue, the different uh, policy issues. 
And usually if we should submit um, um, joint statements or we can comment on some legislation, very often we do it together. Uh, and I think this, this coordination on, on, on policies, that's quite advanced. Uh, but of course, there might be some peculiarities and, and uh, differences in views uh, between Visegrad four countries. This is also not a problem. Uh, we are very openly discussing uh, that with, 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 with the partners. And I think the advantage of Visegrad four cooperation is that it's, it's a very straightforward cooperation practical cooperation. If we uh, see that we do not agree on, on some elements, we do not force to do that, uh, to have a common position on, on each uh, of the points. On, um, uh, I think your question on fossil fuel is a very good one, uh, because uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, is a, that makes a clear difference uh, between uh, Visegrad four countries and the region, Central Eastern European region, and maybe other parts of uh, Europe. I think uh, in our region, uh, 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 coal has still quite an important role, especially in Poland, uh, where the whole uh, energy uh, sector is based on, on coal firing technologies. And basically to switch uh, from one day to another uh, to completely uh, uh, other technologies or renewables, this is unfortunately not feasible in the practice. As I mentioned, supply security and, and price uh, uh, issues here comes into the picture. So therefore, uh, I think natural gas as a transitional fuel to, to reduce CO2 emissions that could play a very uh, important part in that part of Europe, uh, because to switch coal-fired technologies to gas-fired technologies, this is relatively simple and quick. And we don't have to wait 20, 30 years to replace uh, completely uh, existing infrastructures and to build new one and to have renewables. But we can save a lot of CO2 emission by this small change to switch coal to gas. And in the meantime, of course, we will develop renewables, uh, but it needs time, it needs investment, and it needs infrastructure, which, 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 which is not so quick than just changing coal firing technologies with natural gas firing technologies. So I think uh, uh, we have in Hungary one big uh, coal firing power plant, uh, and this uh, power plant alone uh, means 15% of the Hungarian CO2 emission. And I think if we can change the technology of this power plant, then we already achieved a lot. And actually, this is also our plan in the government that uh, by 2026, uh, we will uh, change the technology to uh, natural gas. And by changing this technology, we will save uh, three quarters of the emission of that power plant. So I think that's a huge uh, achievement in a couple of years. Uh, if we would uh, do the same uh, to close completely the power plant and to build renewables, I think that would take much more time. And of course, renewables have still uh, the opportunity to be included into the Hungarian energy mix. So I think this is a very good example and fossil fuel and, and especially natural gas as an interim solution, not final solution, but interim solution in the Central Eastern European region. That's very important for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. You also answered almost the next question if I was, wanted to ask about what we can do until 2030. And you also mentioned already the 2026 aim to, to change the technology of coal power plants, for example. So uh, maybe we will um, make this passage a bit shorter because we have some questions still coming up. We will stick now to the current question. Uh, what's the important, uh, how is the European Green Deal connected to the Central and Eastern European countries and the Visegrad region? I would um, now um, give the mic to Lila. What do you think? You can also comment on what Mr. Steiner said, or you can um, go with your statement. Please feel free to, feel free to speak. Thank you so much. 
Um, so first of all, I was very happy to hear uh, so many times the word cooperation, because I just simply think that sustainable development means the possibility to really for the region, not only just to cooperate, but also to be really leaders when I come to the CE region um, for, for sustainability. Um, I believe that in the long run, if we, if we do it right, then really the Visegrad region can be the, the spearhead of the sustainability action uh, in, the, in the CE region. Um, and, and really just to maybe to, 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 to approach it from a different uh, perspective a bit. Um, and, and this is also something I think we can, we can also discuss um, during the upcoming questions. But um, when we see, for example, on the international level, what we see is obviously non-binding commitments from member states of the UN, uh, which, is, which is really great. But as we do know, uh, legally non-binding um, commitments, it's, they are really, really hard to actually follow up on. And, and obviously when we step, step just uh, one step down and um, so-called an inverse pyramid, how I like to call it, starting really from, from the UN level and going one step down to the intergovernmental level, the EU, Obviously, there we can find uh, uh, more binding uh, legal instruments, but still here comes the problem of competences. If you see uh, the, uh, the question of, uh, and put together in a matrix, for example, the three dimensions of SDGs, uh, the, the environmental, the social, and the economic, and also on the other hand, you, uh, you take a look at the, the competences of national and European and shared, what you can see is, is it's really by its nature limiting that, for example, the European Union can act um, much more uh, freely, so to say, when it comes to the, the environmental aspects, but much less when it comes to the social and economic pillars, simply because the majority of these goals that are under these pillars are actually um, like falling under national competence. As he, and here comes, I think, the importance of regional cooperation, because then the governments, uh, the national governments can actually cooperate much more um, when, when they have high level discussions. And, and as uh, State Secretary, Mr. State Secretary mentioned, it's really, really good to hear that actually these high level cooperations are happening. Um, and our goal, uh, our, our message with, with V4SDG would be to, to, to also keep this discussion going, but also uh, reach out more to, to the business sector and the NGO sector, and also involve them much more in the process to really build the Visegrad countries from bottom-up initiatives when it comes to the question of sustainability. Uh, but I believe that uh, in the long run, really the main aim should be to, um, to really be the leading role and take the leading role when it comes to sustainability, because the Visegrad cooperation has an immense potential, uh, which is, we should just turn it to the right direction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe I would combine it all, already with the next question and then um, turn to Samuel and Andras. If we speak about the European Green Deal and how it could provide a meaningful impact. And we're thinking about also the big theme of today. We are speaking of about soft climate 2030. So this is actually quite a short amount of time. It's just like around the corner. So what, what do you think? Uh, can we have a meaningful impact already by 2030? Um, which challenges can we ex expect? I mean, about which solutions would you think? And here I would turn to Andras. Well, I already had a lot of things in my mind, but you just add another question. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, you I can, mean, of course, combine it as well. The, the, the aims for the Visegrad countries by 2030. Yeah, yeah, I, I would try to, to, you know, uh, summarize my thoughts. So uh, um, on reflecting uh, to the previous interventions, I, I fully agree with, with Mr. State Secretary that there's already uh, a well-established cooperation in, in policy making, uh, but I was I was more arguing for uh, co more cooperation in implementation. So I would like to see much more, uh, you know, cooperation in terms of uh, I don't know energy policy, transportation, agriculture, uh, uh, finance, whatever uh, related to to the green transition. So I, I think there is a lot to to. Uh, to do in, in, in these uh, aspects uh, among the we four countries because uh, uh, he was right that we have a similar starting point. And by the way, I also wanted to mention the fact that the climate performance so far uh, of the V4 countries is uh, well uh, above the EU average. So we reduced our greenhouse gas emissions 
more than the EU average, uh, especially compared to uh, certain um, uh, Western European countries, which I'm not going to mention uh, tonight. But uh, yeah, so uh, we, we are in a good starting point. And actually, we already suffered the consequences of a, uh, uh, an economic transition from the communist era. Uh, so this reduction, some say that the GHG reduction is, is the only concept, is the, uh, the transition uh, uh, from the communism area is the only reason of the, uh, of the greenhouse gas emission reduction, but it's not true in one hand, but on the other hand, it's true, but we suffered the social consequences. And what we would like to avoid this time with regards to the green transition or the implementation of the European Green Deal is not to widen the, the gap between uh, Eastern part and the Western part of Europe. And I think this uh, should be taken into account in the implementation of the European Green Deal. And there's this overarching principle uh, called the just transition, uh, which is, uh, um, uh, when they talk about they they mainly mean the the just transition of the workforce so we have to take care of the people who are losing their jobs but i don't think that this is only about that it's also about the general uh you know uh, justice of the of the transition i mean uh, that what i was trying to say not to widen the gap between the western part and the eastern part of europe so we need to we need really to pay attention on on that uh, aspect. And what about 2030? Uh, uh, if I reckon well, the, the name of the project was Solve Climate by 2030 or something like that. Yes. I'm, I'm sure we will not solve the climate issue by 2030. I'm sorry about that. But but this is this is the last decade, as I said, when we can turn uh, the, the processes into the right direction. And we, we have to see a major uh, shift in terms of how we do our economy, how we do our business, how we live our everyday lives by 2030 already in order to, to get to the climate neutrality, which is a common goal of the European Union, by the way, already a national goal of Hungary, uh, because we cannot leave everything to the very last moment, right? Uh, if you think about it, we, have, uh, we are in, in, in the middle of this uh, time frame uh, between 1990 and 2050. So this 60 uh, years period, it, we are right in the, in the middle of it. So we have uh, that much time left, what we already uh, uh, had uh, from 1990, and the emission reductions are not, not enough uh, to be re uh, you know, replayed. Uh, we need to accelerate the emission reductions, but not only that, we also need to uh, widen our sink potential because sinks are also disappearing. We are rather talk about mitigation or, or mainly talk about mitigation, but we also need to talk about adaptation aspects as well, where the V4 countries has also a similar problems, I would say. So we, we can cooperate in, in that regard as well. So there are a lot of aspects uh, that worth to discuss how we can strengthen our efforts. Thank you. Yeah. I think here's a main point is cooperation and implementation and this pragmatical view that ah, that will be challenging. I would maybe reframe it challenging, challenging to reach this 2030 aims. So what is a young generation like Samuel thinking about? Uh, do you agree with the view that we are that is we will not solve the climate by 2030? Or do you think we, we can move forward to that goal a bit more optimistic, maybe? But then which challenges do you see? and um, yeah, maybe you could think also about a solution uh, now, a bit more broadly speaking about a political level, maybe. Yeah, I think that we can, until 2030, not solve the, the problem, but we can lose the problem until 2030. So it is, it is very important to, to accelerate the effort uh, massively. And um, yeah, it's um, you can say it's five to, to twelve. It's um, if you listen to what actually climate scientists are, are telling, then uh, we are in a in a point that we the whole world has to to massively increase um, their efforts to um, bring it down to the course to reach 
climate neutrality uh, by 2050. And uh, therefore, yeah, maybe one point to what um, Mr. State Secretary uh, Steiner said um, with the, the natural gas, I, I do think that is it can be problematic to now in invest in, um, in in natural gas and i would recommend instead to to um, now directly make the um, the transition uh, towards renewable energies since also um, investors need long term investment security and um, therefore i think that it can be um, yeah, more um, sustainable and also from a financial perspective, uh, more effective to um, make the transition fast rather than um, yeah, um, taking taking more time uh, for getting done with that. Yeah, I think we could pass the ball back to, to Mr. State Secretary here because he was directly mentioned. I think that the challenge here is uh, the, the debate about direct investment now into renewables or this bit slower approach about um, LNG and um, doing it a bit more step by step. Uh, State Secretary, feel free to answer to, to this um, comment by Samuel. Thank you. I'm very happy that um, uh, we have this discussion on, on natural gas. I think we need all of the uh, uh, technologies which help us to reach uh, climate neutrality or to get on this path uh, to reach climate neutrality. Just uh, to make, make you clear what, why we say a natural gas is needed, not because we think that that will be the ultimate solution, not at all. Of course, if that would be, we, we would be in, uh, uh, in the situation to change from one day to another to uh, uh, renewable electricity generation, we would prefer that uh, solution. But unfortunately, energy systems do not uh, uh, work like that. Um, this power plant, which I mentioned, this coal-fired power plant, this, this supplies uh, one quarter of the uh, uh, hung the Hungarian territory with electricity. If we would say that we will close it from uh, may may uh, maybe today, then what would we do or with those um, households tomorrow, how we could supply them with electricity? The solution would be that we would import more. And what we would import uh, from neighboring countries, uh, electricity generated by coal-fired power plants. So I don't think that that's, that's the solution. What we have in mind that uh, we could already uh, uh, make this uh, coal power plant transition uh, quickly with the switch to natural gas. And in the meantime, of course, we, de we develop a significant amount of renewable electricity generation capacities. This is exactly our plan. Uh, we would like to uh, 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 have renewable electricity generation capacity six times more uh, by 2030 than today. I think this is a significant uh, jump and this is a huge plan, but we need all of the technologies. That would not be enough to uh, provide supply security and the price issue, what, what I mentioned. Uh, so therefore, this balanced approach and to implement all of the strategies parallelly. This is, this is crucial. Of course, uh, um, as a government, uh, we have, um, uh, you know, uh, the responsibility that supply security and also the prices shall be respected. So from a government perspective, uh, uh, and to what I mentioned in my opening uh, uh, remarks, that uh, we think that these uh, aspects are very important to get the support of all of the citizens. And, uh, and, and therefore, we have this plan. Um, actually, uh, our plan is that by 2030, 90% uh, of the Hungarian electricity generation will be CO2 emission free. So I think that shows that, yes, we can achieve a lot. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, we need accelerated efforts. I, I fully agree with that. And we would like to utilize all of the funds 
uh, to to get uh, these um, goals uh, uh, achieved. And this is also our plan to use the European Union funds, uh, partly to uh, increase the share of renewables in Hungary, mostly solar panels, and how we can incorporate those uh, solar panels in, into the Hungarian national electricity system, since uh, maybe the cost of that will be even higher than to only install the solar panels themselves. So therefore, you, we have to think uh, in a system and we have to see which element of the system uh, is, uh, uh, needs more, more uh, focus and more funds and more investment. And I think that will be a step-by-step -step, um, approach. Uh, and we have to see how the whole system will work as a whole and not only focus on one or two elements. So this is the key uh, challenge in the future how to make it feasible. And therefore, you need a horizontal approach, not only focusing on one or two elements. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think this is what the, this debate is about, to have a dialogue and to exchange some thoughts. Uh, so I'm very glad that we have like a kind of passionate discussion here. Um, with um, having the time in mind, I would like to come to the next um, block of questions. Uh, I really would like to continue here, but um, we have some guests which also wait with questions. Uh, I would turn now to Lila. I would like to speak about um, our current pandemic. Um, what do you think? Is the pandemic kind of like a new window of opportunity um, for the Visegrad countries or for Europe? Um, you can answer um, in, in an area where you feel more comfortable. Um, do you think we can make now the best out of sustainability and move toward a brighter future with, with this pandemic uh, almost behind us and having some lessons learned? Thank you so much, Rafal. So I believe that sustainability and having the sustainable development goals in mind obviously has always been important. But with the current pandemic, I think that it has been really an eye opener. And also um, it's, it's been a really unique uh, opportunity on the one hand, but also a really risky one on the other hand, because if we just take a look, for example, on the, on the timeline, when it comes to the European Green Deal, obviously just in December, 2019, um, it has been announced and then the, the pandemic just came and then the whole, whole um, action plan and the whole timeline has shifted. And obviously, I still remember that the first first few weeks of the pandemic, uh, it, it started with a really strong discussion on, on the European level and the, the European Parliament um, on whether and how much should the green agenda be, be left behind and really how should the, the focus concentrate on the pandemic and mitigating the pandemic. And I think the, the most important uh, and key takeaway from this whole situation is that uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't left the, the green agenda behind, so to say. However, I don't don't really like this expression because obviously sustainability means so much more than just uh, just the environmental issues. But let's just call it green agenda for now. And, and really what we can see, I believe, is that uh, luckily it has been um, discovered and it has, has been put on the agenda to combine the unfortunate situation at the moment with the possibility and with the immense opportunity that the, the Sustainable Development Goals and, and its implementation actually um, have. And, and really now we have the opportunity to, to build back better in a sense that now we can combine really rebuilding uh, not just our country is not just the region, but the whole Europe uh, with having sustainability in mind. And we can start really uh, putting the bricks uh, just one onto another and, and really uh, turn towards sustainability and realize that if we don't do it now, it just, the time will be just too, too um, short until until the, the goal date. Obviously, when it comes to, just to reflect back on your previous question, when it comes to the days 2030 and 2050, Obviously, um, the the international level with the UN having its its um, targets um, set to 2030, and with the European Union having its targets set in 2050, we can see a bit of a, a difference. But I think that this layered approach can actually be be seen when it comes to also the timeline. So I do believe that by 2030, we will actually reach not the, if if not the goals themselves, but just really 
not just raising awareness, but really already establishing the firm basis of cooperation, uh, either on regional, European or international level. And then uh, hopefully by, by 2050, by, by the date set by the European uh, agenda, we can actually turn our region and the whole European Union uh, really much more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hussar, uh, what is your take on that question particularly? I don't want to sound too pessimistic, but uh, my experience is that humanity only learns from catastrophes. And uh, this pandemic is, is, is a catastrophe in itself and uh, uh, there are so many people dying. And so for that reason, I, I don't really like to, to call this pandemic as an opportunity. But I think I would, I would rather say it's a, it's, it's a warning that we should take very seriously. And not least because this pandemic has something to do with our uh, uh, economic uh, uh, activities and the way how we live and the way how we treat environment. Uh, and also, um, it is also a warning sign that we, we did not take serious enough science because this was well uh, uh, before predicted that some kind of uh, pandemic like that will, will, will happen. And actually now there are uh, warnings that similar pandemics uh, can happen in the future. And we need to be prepared for that much more than we were. Um, obviously, um, if you are working uh, as a, a climate uh, uh, expert or, or, or somebody who, who follows all these green related policies, you can easily um, uh, be misled by the fact that so many people are talking about build back better uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But if you look at the numbers, like how much money governments are spending on uh, traditional business as usual uh, activities uh, in order to save the so-called uh, traditional way of the economy, uh, it's very disappointing. And not enough money is channeled into a, a green uh, um, um, uh, reboot, rebooting of the economy. So we are not spending enough money on the, on the green recovery. Uh, within the EU, fortunately, as Lila was saying, there was a debate whether we should you know, put aside uh, the European Green Deal and let's focus on the pandemic itself. But I think this debate has been decided in, in a right uh, way because uh, uh, the, the Commission and the member states as well said that, no, no, we, we need a green, uh, European Green Deal Plus. And that's why uh, they um, created the Resilience and Re uh, Recovery Facility, which channels huge amount of money into the, the green uh, recovery of the economy. But I think we should, we should take it very seriously because as I said, uh, we are in the last decade to act. And now we have uh, been given the money, the enough uh, amount of uh, financial resources to do the transition. But if we waste all this money into the wrong uh, activities, then it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a missed opportunity uh, twofold. So we are running out of time in terms of uh, GHG emissions, et cetera but we also wasted a huge amount of money. So I think we really need to be cautious what we are spending this money on. Uh, but unfortunately, as I said, if you, if you see it globally, there are uh, very good studies on that, that uh, more than 90% of the reco recovery funds of the uh, national governments are spent to fossil fuel, to save fossil fuel uh, economic sectors or to save uh, aviation companies, et cetera. Uh, which is which is not the not the right way to do things. So I'm I'm a little bit cautious to be uh, you know optimistic uh, uh, that that this pandemic is a, is a good opportunity. It it can be, but we need to be very serious in that. Um, I maybe Mr. State Secretary would like to answer to Mr. Mr. Hussar's thoughts. I would make just a short remark because we have a lot of questions also coming up for the Q&A. Um, I would give you the choice. Maybe you could already um, also mention the what we we as the youth or as the young generation can do. And there's a bit, yeah, a bit more, yeah, I would say dark future or realistic future, Mr. Hussar's maybe rightly so, 
is explaining what can the use do to maybe make a counter um, counter action or work on that but also feel free to to answer on or reflect on his thoughts i would give you the free choice how you would like to proceed yeah i think in in, in I, regard of generation just just a second now mr uh, mr Atila steiner and then I, I would come back to you if it's okay ah sorry sorry then uh, did i go wrong no problem we could uh, go forward like that, but uh, uh, just maybe some reflections what uh, Mr. Hussa said. Um, actually, I think the key question uh, is uh, what will be the new normal after the pandemic is over? And uh, here it's, it's absolutely not obvious. I think, um, uh, of course, uh, there are several difficulties uh, which uh, shall be uh, tackled uh, and there are still significant difficulties. But of course, there are also some positive side effects of the pandemic. For example, uh, we organize uh, this webinar and we are not traveling uh, throughout Europe and we save a lot of CO2 emissions. Uh, so I think that's a key, how we will return to the, no to the normality and what will be the, the new normality. And I think um, if we can uh, learn a little bit uh, and focus more on our uh, direct environment because several people are now in quarantine and basically forced to be at home and have a look on the um, immediate environment I think that could that could help to change uh, people's mentality maybe I'm a little bit over optimistic in that sense but uh, but uh, I'm I think that uh, that that might uh, 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 change people's everyday behavior Maybe a second um, aspect that I think uh, if we have a look on uh, the uh, past of the European Union, uh, 10, 15 years, uh, I was deeply involved in European legislation and European negotiations. And actually the last 15 years is about crisis management. And um, I think here uh, we have to draw the lesson that uh, Europe should increase its uh, flexibility and resilience uh, because uh, we, we can be sure that uh, what we can expect, these, these are unexpected crises uh, in the future and unexpected factors which uh, will come. And we cannot be always busy with uh, crisis management and not focusing on, on other factors and other policies. So therefore, I think the key will be how we can increase uh, our capability to cope with unexpected uh, uh, happenings and, and uh, factors. And therefore, somehow the resilience of the continent, the resilience of the regions, the resilience of, of nations shall be increased. And this is a key challenge how to do that. And I think, uh, theoretically, the European Union would be uh, a good structure for that because we have a, a, a continent-wide cooperation, which provides, for example, a single market with very stable and robust uh, structures and institutions. However, in the same time, we have also member states and regions which can adopt more quickly to, to uh, big challenges and changes. And if we could combine these two, adaptation and, and robustness, I think that could be the future for Europe. Um, uh, and I think the pandemic very, uh, very, uh, it was a very good um, uh, wake up call for that to, to implement and basically to have a synergy of, 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 of this uh, structure. And maybe a last remark on the funds, uh, as Mr. Hussar mentioned, fortunately, uh, in the uh, European negotiations on the next uh, EU budget and recovery facility. Um, there is an overall objective that 30% of those funds, which is approximately uh, uh, four or five uh, hundred billion euros, huge amount, that should be spent on, on green transition. And I think this is an excellent view, uh, excellent news. And of course, key will be how implementation will look like, but I think the Commission will be uh, very uh, strict on, on that. I had already some discussions in the European Commission and we really had to uh, 
show to the Commission that we are spending on that amount on, on green projects. Uh, and th that's the reason why we have a very significant component in the Hungarian uh, envelope for renewables and to increase the flexibility of the electricity system. So I can confirm that that's happening also in the, in the, in the practice. And I'm optimistic in, on, in that sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I interrupted Mr. Schmidt, uh, the, the comment before. So uh, please feel to, to comment on Mr. Husa or Mr. State Secretary. Um, I would give you now the, the last word of the question round. And I, I think we could afterwards um, turn to the Q&A session. So you have the last word for this round. Um, yeah, I, I do agree that, that we have to, that, that the European Union has to try to um, connect the, the dots also between the different resources and between those challenges of digitalization and, and the Green Deal. And that there are opportunities to, to um, see that as a holistic approach and as um, also with, uh, with, as a combination of, of, of those challenges and um, yeah, there we are. We are on the same line. Um, I'm, I can refer to COVID nineteen uh, um, in addition, Mr. Fabianovic. Yes. Uh, all right. Um, so, in in regard of the pandemic, I I think we went to three different stages. Um, and um, therefore, a, a tipping point was reached with the recovery um, for the, I think that it, it is a, a major point because at first, um, since mobility was reduced anyway through the lockdowns and, uh, and so on, um, at first it, the, the ambition um, of climate governance um, was therefore reduced a little bit, and and um, with that um, huge uh, and um, the resilience uh, facility for that was also mentioned already. Um, there was this moment when, when um, the many many uh, actors realized that that um, a shift now um, is necessary, and that that's the moment because such a such a huge uh, resilience uh, package with 1750 billion is not coming up every year. So, um, and that's why it is so so important to invest that money now in in in, in the right manner and in a sustainable manner. And um, therefore, uh, now now um, the the member states had done a draft already. Um, before COVID-19 um, on, on, um, on their, their 2030 plans, um, now um, the situation changed and um, there is much more money available. So now that is, I think, a crucial question now on how this additional money of the resilience for is now uh, going to be invested um, in the different member states and that, that uh, it should be invested in future technologies, in in um, offshore wind and in um, um, maybe also technologies for uh, even getting um, CO two emissions out of the atmosphere. And there are there are various um, various new technologies, and I think that's uh, the way where uh, the international community has to go. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for all your um, statements and um, thoughts. I would now um, pass the torch to Christina and the Q&A round. Thank you very much for this uh, insightful and open discussion. And um, thanks to all the participants who have already posted uh, really a lot of um, questions and, and kind of engaged in a, uh, in a discussion in a way. Um, I have the challenging task now to summarize that in a way because we don't have uh, that much time to really talk in detail about all of the questions. So what I see what's going on here is really this debate about how do we 
reach the goal in the sparse time that we have? And how much can technologies really help us and which kind of technologies? So there has been a kind of a discussion going on here about the relevance of natural gas. You have talked about that already. So there are some critical opinions about that in the, uh, among the participants that are arguing it is not really the right way. We should go straight forward to um, renewables. Uh, and should not get kind of locked up again in a um, fossil fuels, even if it's a bit less um, of uh, CO2 emissions connected to it. Um, but what I found interesting is that there has been also kind of shift away from this focus on technologies. So asking um, some of the uh, participants talked about what else is there that we need to think of and can we really solve uh, climate by 2030? just with technologies. Um, and um, I will just use one question posed by Agatha as kind of uh, an example of that debate, um, saying we need to think more critically about, can we really decouple economic growth from um, CO2 emissions or any kind of other impacts on the environment? Um, she uh, took the position that we cannot. Uh, we need to move beyond growth and understand that we cannot keep growing on a planet that has limited resources. What are your thoughts on this and how do you see us progressing in light of the latest scientific evidence on the limits of growth? So I would like to pose this question um, to the panelists. Who would like to, to start? Ms. Bartosek, maybe you want to start? Well, thank you, first of all, for so, so many questions. Uh, I myself am not an expert in energy, such uh, it is. Uh, however, uh, I, I do think that if we, um, if we take a look at the question uh, also on, on how the whole Green Deal, how can we also include uh, not just the energy sector, not just technologies, yeah. but also uh, there is a, a really great question uh, if, if, if uh, you lent me to, to also reflect to that, how can we bring the Green Deal closer to, um, to the citizens? And I think that also is in line with the previously uh, stated questions. I believe that the, the way to do that and to way to, to also include the discussion um, about the energy sector, about the, the IT sector, um, about, about transport, uh, about, about commerce. I think that the best way to do that and also to bring this whole topic closer to the citizens is by including them. And also uh, there is this, this buzzword of multi-stakeholder approach. And I, uh, I do believe that this is the key uh, to answer it because this is how we can get also more experts uh, when it comes to the energy sector. This is how the debate about whether to straight to go, go to the, the um, renewables or also go along as, as, as uh, it has been described with the, this, this fossil fuel and renewable battle. Also when it comes to how technology can, can help um, when it comes to uh, the implementation of the SDGs. Uh, these are all things that, that can the best be answered by those that are living in that, that are practicing it. And, and these are the, uh, the businesses, the, the citizens, uh, the NGOs and, and the lobby uh, um, organizations working in these sectors. So I think channeling in their opinion and also, um, also making sure that they are included in the whole discussion is the key. Uh, and then no matter what sector are we referring to. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Um, Mr. Steiner, you want to reflect on that as well? Like what are other um, solutions despite the importance of technology? What else is there that we need to consider to get closer to solving climate? Yes, yes. Yes, indeed. I, I think um, uh, the um, Hungarian and, and, and the regional uh, performance and achievements show that currently it's possible to decouple economic growth and emissions because we have still a, a lot of low-hanging fruits and a lot of uh, saving potential. So I think we have to follow this track and try to uh, maintain economic growth and uh, in the meantime, uh, reduce emissions. The Hungarian performance is an excellent example. Uh, during the last 30 years, we managed to reduce our emissions by 30, 33%. But of course, GDP uh, 
uh, growth was very significant during these um, 30 years. But I think that situation will change as we will go closer to the, to the climate neutrality and we will reach like 80, 90% of CO2 emission reduction. And uh, that uh, might change the whole picture and maybe yes, um, economic development uh, should have a limit. Uh, but what we do not see at this moment, what will happen on a technology side in 20 or 30 years, because mm. I think there will be huge development if there will be uh, 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 sufficient financial incentives uh, to do that. We have also currently some promising uh, technologies like hydrogen, which was mentioned. Actually, now we are in the middle of preparing a Hungarian hydrogen uh, hydro hydrogen strategy, actually to see uh, where we could have a competitive advantage in this hydrogen supply chain as yeah. Hungary. And uh, we would like to invest a lot on those fields where we can have significant value added. Mm -hmm. But I do not think that at this stage we can say uh, what will be the real impact of hydrogen, which is still an infant uh, uh, technology or the supply chain itself, it's, it's, it's still not mature. So therefore, I, I think technology and research and development can provide uh, huge opportunities. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, we have to invest also in that, in, in that uh, area in order to, to uh, reach climate neutrality in a post-efficient manner by 2015. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hussa, you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I, I took some notes. I, I read through the questions and <laughs> I would like to reflect a couple of them. So with regards to the role of technology, um, I'm not a technology optimist, neither a technology pessimist, but I, I would give you an example why technology only would not solve the, the climate crisis. So if you look at the nice graphs of the International Energy Agency, for instance, you will see that the growing number of renewable energy capacities can only compensate the growth in the energy demand. So basically they are not replacing fossil fuel energy production, but they are only uh, covering uh, the, grow, the growing trend in energy demand, which shows that uh, even if we, you know, uh, if we continue this uh, trend of growing energy demand, we will get nowhere uh, because we, we have to, you know, cover the whole uh, energy production uh, with, with renewable energy or with uh, zero greenhouse gas emitting energy producing uh, uh, technology. But so my point is that you need to you need to look at the 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 how we how we do things basically. So we need to reduce the demand for energy, not uh, not only the production type of energy. And I think there are huge potentials uh, in that uh, because uh, we are using way too much energy than than we should use. I think and and there's a there's another important initiative in the European Union what he, what we have not yet talked about, which is the circular economy mm -hmm. uh, initiative. And this uh, addresses exactly that. So how we should save uh, uh, raw materials, uh, how we should uh, recycle uh, uh, waste, etc., in order not to use as much resources as we are currently using. Because if the, as they say, the greenest energy is the energy that you have not consumed at all. Uh, so therefore you, because uh, it would be impossible to, to cover growing energy demand, even with renewable energy, because don't don't uh, uh, don't get it wrong. Uh, uh, I mean, solar panels are also needs uh, mining activities. They are, they also need uh, um, you know uh, maintenance, uh, and and uh, they they will they will become also waste. So so mm. don't think that renewable energy technology is hundred uh, percent GHG emitting free technology. Uh, that that's my first uh, point. The second point is about uh, artificial removal technologies like uh, carbon capture and storage or carbon capture and utilization. Uh, there are so many uh, discussion on that, uh, whether we need them or not. Uh, uh, well, most of the models that use uh, that, that were used in, in the EU and uh, by the commission as well, uh, said that we cannot achieve climate neutrality without artificial removal technologies. Mm. 
uh, which is in a way it's sad, but I think it shows the importance uh, of that. But at the same time, my point is here that uh, are we sure that we discussed uh, uh, entirely the, the capacity in growing our natural uh, removal capacities? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, forests, uh, grasslands, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think we need to have a serious discussion on, on that. And some people even argue that we need to set uh, similar goals uh, to uh, to the removal uh, uh, to to removals as we do for the uh, emissions. I mean, uh, by how many percent we would like to expand our removal, our natural removal capacities by 2030 or by 2050. Mm -hmm. So this is another uh, interesting discussion. I think uh, what 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 we should have uh, in in the in the near future. With regards to economic growth, well, I mean, it's an endless discussion probably. Uh, my, my opinion is always that GDP is, is one of the worst uh, thing to, to measure uh, growth because uh, let's, let's think about an example when children are playing and they broke the window of the house with their football and the window is replaced by a, a window repairman and that increases GDP. But what, what good has happened in the world at all? Nothing, right? So uh, uh, we, are, we are right at the same place where we were, only a, a broken window has been changed, which increased GDP, but uh, nothing, nothing good has happened in the world. So I think uh, GDP is, is, is a very, very bad uh, thing that we are using, but uh, unfortunately, Hungary or the EU as a whole is not able to change that measurement. Uh, we need to come together at a global level and to have a serious discussion on how we can replace this, because currently everybody is looking at, at uh, uh, the, when, when someone is looking at the country's performance, they look at the GDP numbers, right? Mm -hmm. and, and as long as we follow this pattern, um, I don't think that uh, anything good can, can uh, come, up, come out in the, in the long term because yeah, in the short term or mid term, yeah, it's fine. We can decouple for some decades, probably uh, economic growth and, and uh, GHG emissions. But in the long term, I, I don't think we, we can we can continue uh, this trend. The, the European Green Deal was not only presented as a man on the moon moment of the EU, but also as a new growth strategy of the EU, uh, which was a little bit disappointing for me because it showed that it's not a real paradigm shift uh, by the Commission because they are continue to believe that economic growth is possible in in the in the long term uh, together with. Uh, uh, with the environmental uh, action. Uh, and finally, there was a question about the aspect of uh, territory, uh, the measurement, how we measure greenhouse gas emissions, because currently they are measured te uh, territorially. So we are, we are uh, only looking at uh, GHG emissions from a given territory, uh, naturally from uh, uh, the territory of member states, for instance, but it's kind of misleading because the EU is so proud that we have reduced our green, greenhouse gas emissions by more than 20% now uh, since 1990. But if you measure the emissions uh, based on consumption, for instance, that shows a much, much different picture. Because what we did, uh, I mean, mainly in the Western part of, of the EU, but the EU as a whole, is that we outsource uh, some kind, some uh, uh, heavily um, polluting activities outside uh, the EU, and then we import it back the end results. Mm -hmm. And the related emissions uh, have been accounted in those countries where they were produced, like in China or, or uh, Africa or, or uh, uh, Eastern Europe, like Ukraine, uh, etc. Uh, but this does not do good, do any good uh, globally because uh, climate change is a global problem. We have one, uh, one uh, common atmosphere. So it doesn't matter where the emission is coming from. So I think we really need to reconsider that. And for instance, in the UK, I, I uh, participated in, in, a, in a webinar by the Climate Change Committee of the UK, and they take it very seriously that they also measure the consumption-based emission of the United Kingdom. And they... Uh, provide recommendations to the government how they can uh, uh, reduce uh, emissions based on, on their consumption. So I think uh, we, we need to do something similar within the EU as well. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much for um, these uh, thoughts. And um, as you pointed out, this is a really broad debate, but I think it's it's important that we think of it and that you also pointed out it's a global issue. So we tend to think sometimes very much in our own um, terms of our own country or our own um, or in European terms, which is important, which uh, we need to do. But um, I think some of the questions and also what you just said show that we have to also consider the, the global perspective of it. And um, but to, to close down, uh, I want to come back actually to the uh, local or to the um, what we actually can do, because some uh, of the questions were really um, going to the direction, what kind of change do we need? Do we need a certain cultural change, um, a, a different type of um, behavior, um, different way of thinking, different mindset. So um, on these um, maybe more creative thoughts, um, I will give you one uh, more say to each of you. This time I will start uh, with uh, Mr. Schmidt and this will um, then also be concluding uh, your concluding statement. All right, yeah, I, I think it's uh, important to mention also that um, preventing climate change is a multi-level governance topic and therefore you, you have all those levels interacting strongly with each other and all, all levels and all various different actors have to come together and, and to participate in, in reaching that goal. And on the, the local level, there are, there are so many um, measures that can be done within cities, for example, because cities are um, uh, spheres where, where life is, is going on, where um, you, you have people coming together and you, you, you can be creative in um, starting to rethink how um, can, can we live in the future in, in, in cities? What, what are uh, tools and, um, that, that we, can, we can change for from make cities more sustainable? And um, therefore you can plant, for example, trees. You make the city more livable. Uh, uh, parks with trees uh, looks nice. And <laughs> at the same time, uh, you do something uh, in, in regard of uh, CO, getting CO2 out of the atmosphere in a, in a, in a natural manner, or, or, or just, um, uh, for example, on, on weekdays, um, handing over public transport for free, or there are, there are various ideas. And I think in, in, in that um, direction, and there's a lot of potential and, and there we, we um, really have to to, to think creative and out of the box. And on, on the global um, dimension, uh, we are heading towards the COP26 that is going to take place in, in November in Glasgow. It was now uh, pushed forward one year. Last year, it wasn't happening because of um, COVID-19. And I think therefore it, it, it is very important that the European Union speaks with one voice and, and that um, the member states come together and and, and um, therefore I, I hope it's possible finally to reach an, an, a common uh, voice uh, that is at the same time a high and ambitious level to go uh, strongly uh, and uni united uh, into that, that um, COP26. Thank you. Thank you. This is the perfect... Um way to ask Mr. Steiner, what do you hope for for, um, for Hungary to achieve? And also, as we just heard, um, the European Union um, towards um, the global responsibility it has. Yes, thank you. I think uh, uh, we need more consciousness. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I believe that um, education and the power power of example uh, that could help a lot. And I think here the European Union has a, a very important role. Of course, we are we always face the critique that uh, the emissions of the European Union is less than 10%. And without the others, uh, 
uh, why we should do uh, and uh, uh, implement enhanced efforts because the others are not doing that. But on the other side, I think leading by example uh, that could that could really help, uh, and uh, that could also help in the everyday life and in our life. So I think um, I'm quite optimistic with the younger generation. I have also three kids, and they are also very uh, environment cautious conscious and uh, and uh, actually uh, if uh, we could also introduce in the education uh, uh, this uh, awareness raising uh, 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 then I think uh, we would be on the on the right track but what is my experience if you would like to go uh, forward uh, in the short term that uh, we should also provide financial incentives uh, to, to achieve real uh, change. And maybe let's, uh, let me highlight only one example on that. Uh, in Hungary, uh, it's a, a very long-term problem to have illegal waste across the country. And now uh, we started the program how to eliminate those illegal waste deposits. And uh, we uh, think that, of course, you need financial resources for that, you need a good example for that, uh, you need financial incentives for the citizens to do that, uh, but unfortunately sanctions are also needed uh, uh, to do that. Um, and I think the good combination of those elements that could bring uh, the issue forward. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, and also for highlighting the importance of education and awareness raising. This is what we are trying to do here tonight. And um, this will be, I think, a good opportunity now to um, move for a final statement for uh, Ms. Bartusek, um, who's also in this business of spreading awareness. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And I'm really happy that you brought back this question because I was quite disappointed that uh, it, it couldn't fit into the timeline of the original uh, time frame for, for the questions. So yes, indeed, I think when it comes to the question of how can we best achieve really sustainability locally, um, obviously there is uh, one, one element of it, which is individual action, but also there is another element, which is actually collective action. And when it comes to the latter one, I was... Uh, I'm, I'm really once again, I can only refer to, uh, to really including um, everyone, the businesses, um, the civil society and the individuals generally, um, obviously, as well as academia into, um, into this whole, pro whole, whole, um, whole, so to say, uh, I think it's, it's really an era that we currently have in front of us to, to really make sure that we do reach these goals. Um, and when it comes to businesses, really, I think education comes here is in, in as well, for example, when it comes to corporate social responsibility and also just changing the mindset, because sometimes they might be willing to, but they just don't know how to implement uh, these uh, incentives into their, their businesses. Also, when it comes to, to education, uh, yes, indeed, I would, I would be really, really uh, happy to see uh, education being really uh, shifted towards more like sustainability education as well. And this is once again, obviously, uh, it's always, I think, a debated question because, um, because it's obviously a national competence. And this is why it's, it's really, uh, really hugely dependent on, on uh, individual member states, for example, of the union. Um, but also, I think it's really a layered approach. And, and when it comes to the civil society, obviously, they have an immense uh, potential to play and, and really with the multi-stakeholder approach. And when it comes to motivating the, the young generation, uh, I think the best example that we can set uh, forward is really to convince them not to change everything at once, because simply it's not possible and it's unrealistic. Uh, they just have to find the best way they can contribute, uh, whether it's locally uh, or whether it's, it's uh, on a European level, or even just really uh, when it comes to municipality, for example. They just have to find a cause they're passionate about. They have to find really what's interesting for them. And also then they can just, uh, when they are an activist type, they can join an organ. There are lots of organizations really uh, into that direction. And I think it's always interesting to, to really compare activism and also a policy advocacy because I think that these two are really, really closely connected, even though they are different. But when someone feels more comfortable and actually um, 
really the advocacy uh, work then then really just just reach out to to those uh, stakeholders those representatives closest to you uh, and 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 also you can you can really make a difference just the step by step approach but in order to realize how to do that, in order to really have the courage and, and the, the general background knowledge, the general education on sustainability, preferably in a, in a non-frontal, non-formal way, uh, would be very welcome. And I believe that also, obviously, at the end of the day, the governments, um, both at national level and regional cooperation as well, uh, plays a crucial role. And, and this is why, um, even though I know we're short in time, but it would be really interesting to also uh, hear from, from, for example, the, the upcoming uh, V4 presidency of Hungary, obviously, is just around the corner. Uh, and, and obviously, it's really good that we the current Polish presidency already included uh, several sustainability elements. Uh, but we do hope that also it will continue and, and uh, during the Hungarian presidency, we can also see uh, this, this agenda uh, going forward. So um, really, I think the, the best closing um, sentence for, for all this is could be that we can only do it together with all the sectors and all the actors involved. So I do hope that um, with, with further educating uh, our generation and raising awareness, we can actually reach uh, these goals. Uh, quite quite soon and quite efficiently. So thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for your um, yeah really passionate and uh, uh, great insights here. Um, and I want to still give Anna Schusa also the uh, last chance for a last word because I think uh, we we only touched upon briefly that we also have science and uh, policy advice. And I, I know you are engaged in that business. So what um, do you, what is the next steps for you uh, to have implement and solve climate as soon as possible? <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I mean, I truly believe in, in science and I think we, we need to listen much more to science than we did uh, before in terms of uh, decision-making. Uh, I was involved in the work of the IPCC for a couple of years and I saw that uh, role model that needs to be followed. And actually that is why we initiated a national type of IPCC organization in Hungary. And I'm, I'm proud to say that currently there is an interdisciplinary conference going on in Hungary uh, among uh, representatives of various kinds of uh, scientists like uh, economists, uh, doctors, uh, um, lawyers, even uh, meteorological uh, expert, et cetera. And they all came together in order to change views, exchange views. And then uh, we are planning to produce a national type of IPCC report uh, because we believe that it could, it could be a very relevant uh, a food for thought for the government, how to make uh, certain types of decisions in terms of uh, climate policy. Obviously, we are following the patterns of the IPCC. So mm. this report is not uh, policy prescriptive, but policy relevant. So this is very important that we are not trying to say what exactly to do. We are trying to map uh, the situation and, and tell decision makers, if you decide A, then that will be the consequence. If you decide B, then this will be the consequence. And obviously it's the responsibility of the decision makers. But I also wanted to touch upon the aspect of uh, what the individuals can do because uh, I constantly get this question still. And I think uh, we need to differentiate between two aspects of this question. I think uh, now if you Google it, uh, you can find on the internet, uh, uh, a whole different kinds of uh, practices, what you can actually do in your personal life if you want to, if you want to live more sustainably, et cetera. So I think this, this is not a question anymore because there are so many materials that you can read about it. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm, I'm always saying that uh, uh, in terms of real meaningful impact, uh, you have two votes. Everybody has two votes. Well, uh, at least those ones who live in a democracy. <laughs> So one, one vote is obviously the political vote where you can actually decide who you vote on uh, in, in, in the national elections or local elections, et cetera. 
And I would recommend everybody to, to take this very seriously and on, only vote for those kind of uh, political leaders who, who take this problem seriously, the, uh, who have plans, uh, uh, goals in, in, in that direction. So that's one thing that we can do as individuals, but obviously this only happens every four year or every two year, whatever. Uh, and the second vote, which is, which is much more important, I think, or, or equally important rather, is financial vote because you 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 pay for things every day right and you you can actually decide what you're spending your money on obviously it's it's not a, a similar opportunity to everyone because we we know that uh, people are in very different financial situation but i think uh, many people can can decide what they what they spend their their money on and i think it's a it's a it's a vote in itself and and we should not pay for anything which which goes against our values etc and um, yeah so I, I think it's a it's a very important dimension but i also wanted to touch upon is what lila was saying about the, the youth and how to involve them because uh, there's a very unfortunate trend that can be observed now, which is climate anxiety or climate depression among, among youth, because they, they feel that uh, you know, climate change is, is rapidly evolving and they cannot do anything about it because they are not involved in the decision-making properly. Uh, and and, th and this, this whole problem that we created, I mean, previous generations created will affect their lives and they, they cannot do anything about it. But, I'm always saying that you should turn your anxiety into action. And that's what Lila was arguing for. And I, I cannot agree more that uh, youth uh, should be involved in, 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 in actively in uh, climate action. Um, you can you know, uh, organize uh, civil associations, you can come together and uh, organize events, organize uh, uh, corporations, programs, uh, uh, even it, it's even fun, you know, uh, to plant trees, etc. Uh, but but you can also raise awareness among among uh, your generation. I mean, their generation, uh, because uh, what I I still experience is that many people are simply not aware of the problem, which is which is uh, I mean, uh, it it cannot continue like that, right? I mean, everybody has the right to be aware. What are we facing with? And then if we don't act, then, then that's our fault. But if, if we even don't know about the, the severity of the problem, uh, that, that cannot be allowed. And I think that's, that comes back to uh, the role of science. And I think uh, um, the reports of the IPCC is, is, is a little bit difficult to translate into national context. So that's why we, we initiated this national type of IPCC association, because we are trying to... Uh, 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 um, you know, explain to, to local people what is the problem exactly in Hungary and what can you do about it or what the government can do about it. Because uh, I, I'm sure that, that uh, uh, in general, decision makers would also like to go into the right direction, but they, but they need uh, the, the um, supportive uh, information. Uh, and and they, need, they need, for instance, they need numbers. Like if you decide uh, A way, then you have to spend this amount of money, but you will have X amount of, uh, you know, bene uh, um, benefits uh, in the long run so they, they have to see these kind of uh, data and that's that's uh, what the science should provide and and that's what i believe in so that's why i'm doing that thank you thank you so much um, i think that was also a really great concluding uh, statement um, also showing again what are different options that what can we do uh, in different ways in terms of uh, our political behavior, consumption behavior, etc. Um, so I think that's it's very important, and I hope again that we contributed with this um, webinar and your um, really open statements and contributions, also from all the participants um, that have been really engaging in an uh, interesting uh, debate in the chat and post really. Um, demanding and, and, and thoughtful questions and comments. So um, thank you all of you so much for, for sharing this tonight. And uh, I hope we can contribute uh, work against climate anxiety and instead spread awareness. Uh, this webinar is recorded. You can uh, show it to others. And there are other webinars out there that are part of the Solve Climate uh, initiative that might be of interest to you as well. 
I think there's more, um, much more we could debate about, uh, but time is running out. Uh, for those who want to share some more thoughts in a maybe more informal and uh, casual way, there is a Zoom link um, in the chat um, for kind of a virtual coffee break or whatever drink you might have at quarter past eight. Um, so if you want to join us for a little um, informal debate, uh, feel free uh, to do so. But uh, let me thank officially all um, the panelists um, for your time. I know you all have very busy schedules, so thank you so much. Um, and of course, um, thanks to Rafael, who has been the main organizer of this uh, event, um, and to everyone who supported us at Andrashi University. So thank you. And uh, Rafael, you have the final word now. Uh, thank you so much, Christina. I was just thinking about that. I had this um, idea to organize this webinar back in January. It was just an email, what I, what, what I was reading about the South climate. And uh, four months later, we have like a big group here, even Mr. State Secretary and a lot of experts. So my, my take is what everyone can do is just continue the dialogue. So maybe you also have an idea and just implement it and organize a webinar by yourself. And so I think we can continue moving through 20, towards 2030. Um, some best practices, um, if someone um, didn't have the chance to have his um, um, question answered, just write me an email and maybe I can forward it to one or the other um, interested panelists so we can also continue the, the dialogue and not stop here because there was so many questions. And here at this point, special thanks to Mr. Steiner and his office for um, answering emails and phone calls, also to all panelists. Um, thank you to the political science department of Andrash University and special regards to Christina, who is a great um, um, doctor, Caesar supervisor, and um, who put the, also a lot of content into the questions. Thank you to Monica Partacic, the marketing team and the administration team of Andrash University. And also a special thanks to Soft Climate, um, David Blockstein and Dara, Dora Almashi, who were also putting a lot of energy into it. So you see that just like some uh, 90 minute um, webinar, but a lot of people were helping and contributing. So thank you to all involved. And yeah, uh, thank you so much and have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.